One of the most important themes in this class is papal nepotism. And when we look back at the reign of Pope Gregory XIII, it's very interesting to see the complex attitude he had toward his own relatives. On the one hand, a full five years into Gregory's papacy, when the Pope's brother, Bon Compagno Bon Compagni, tried to get permission to come to Rome, Gregory refused to let him even enter the city. The Pope did pay his brother a pension, but it was considered paltry, 100 scudi a month. Bon Compagno was to complain that the pontificate of his brother, Gregory XIII, did him more harm than good, since it obliged him to pay out more because of his new status in terms of expenditure than was covered by the money which he received from the Pope. The Pope did, however, appoint Bon Compagno's son, Filippo, to the cardinalate right off the bat in 1572, Bon Compagno's other son, Cristoforo, as Archbishop of Ravenna in 1578, and also the Pope's nephew, Filippo Guastavellani, son of the Pope's sister. He was made a cardinal in 1574, and it was he who delivered the Pope's principal funeral oration in 1585. Gregory, as we've seen, was also very generous to his own son, Giacomo, also known as Jacopo, born in 1548 and legitimated in 1548 and then again in 1552. It's worth saying a bit about Giacomo Boncompagni, who I consider the last great papal son. Giacomo was educated in Trent, where his father, as we've seen, had served on the council, and later the University of Padua. When he became Pope, Gregory XIII did not hide his paternity of his son in any way. But even in that era, even in the 16th century, it caused concerns. Giacomo himself, at one point, wanted to prove by means of a legal process that he was not the son, but the lawful nephew of Gregory XIII, so that he could receive a cardinalate. When there was a group of influential cardinals, plus the Spanish ambassador, that put him off this idea. Now, a number of popes we've discussed in this course had illegitimate children before receiving holy orders. Pius II, Piccolomini, had at least two. Pope Innocent VIII, Chibo, similarly had two, an illegitimate daughter and son. He was the first pope, at least post-Avignon, to openly acknowledge that he had children. Julius II della Rovere had three illegitimate daughters, including Felice, when he was a cardinal of 12 years standing. Clement VII Medici had an illegitimate son. Similarly, Paul III Farnese, as Cardinal Alessandro Farnese, had three sons and one daughter by his mistress, Silvia Ruffini. What was exceedingly rare, however, was to have children while reigning as pope. And this dubious distinction was held by Pope Alexander VI Borgia, whose later mistress was Cardinal Alessandro Farnese's sister. In all, Borgia had between seven and ten illegitimate children. Well, after this titillating but necessary background, which has embarrassed even modern chroniclers of Gregory XIII's papacy, on August 26th, 1572, less than two weeks after his father Gregory XIII ascended to the throne, Giacomo Boncompagni was nominated to be governor of Castel Sant'Angelo. He was still a student at this point. He was aged 24. In consequence, he transferred from University of Padua to the German-Hungarian College in Rome. But other honors soon followed. In February of 1573, the Comune of Rome made Giacomo an honorary citizen of the city, his descendants too. This class is getting the first glance, I think, ever at this unpublished medal, which is in the possession of the Bon Compagni Ludovici. The medal commemorates the citizenship of uh, Giacomo Bon Compagni, the grant of citizenship, and it's a clever invention which borrows its reverse from a rare coin issue of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. And it shows the personification of Roma, the city of Rome, reclining on seven stylized hills, the seven hills of the city, with the river Tiber and the wolf suckling Romulus and Remus thrown in for good measure. You don't get more Roman than that. On the 17th of April, 1573, Giacomo was made Captain General of the Pontifical Troops, and we've seen he already had charge of Castel San Angelo. And then he was sent immediately to the area of Ancona on the eastern shore of Italy, ostensibly against the Ottoman threat. In the following year, his father dispatched him to Ferrara as his personal representative to meet the future monarch Henry III of France. 
As it so happens, we have a portrait of Giacomo that is contemporary precisely to this time. It's by Scipione Puzzone, a famed portrait uh, artist. This painting was sold in January 2013 by Christie's for almost $7.6 million. The pre-auction estimate was a fraction of that. It ranged from $1.5 to $2.5 million. By Scipione Puzzone was the most important portrait painter in Rome, and in fact in the entire Italian peninsula in the latter part of the 16th century. Uh, this is a portrait of a man named Jacopo Boncampagni, who was the illegitimate son of Pope Gregory XIII. The armor is itself, first of all, a, a signal of Boncampagni's extraordinary wealth, since such lavishly decorated armor was extremely expensive in the 16th century. But the armor also, of course, refers to one companion's role as the commander of the papal troops. Uh, looking close at the face of one companion, uh, there's an extraordinary sense of a living, breathing presence. And this is something for which um, Polzoni was famed in his day. Uh, and in fact, uh, there was a close personal relationship between Polzoni and one companion. In 1574, the year that this portrait was painted, Polzoni named his firstborn son after Buoncompagni, and also made him the godfather of the child. Another remarkable fact about this portrait is that the closest surviving armor to that scene here is preserved today in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. One particularly consequential appointment came on the 1st of August, 1575 when King Philip II of Spain named Giacomo commander-in-chief of the Spanish armies in the state of Milan, in Lombardy and Piedmont. The Villa Aurora archives contain several new documents pertaining to Giacomo's service under Philip II at Milan in the years 1580 to 1583. Further military responsibilities came in 1581. In that year, Gregory XIII invested his son, along with Latino Orsini, with full powers to fight brigands in the Papal States. And this commission, a very important and dangerous commission, lasted until 1583. In this effort, Giacomo's chief adversary was the notorious Duke Alfonso Piccolomini, of a family that had produced two popes. He was now a condottiere, known as the bandit chief, whose mercenaries engaged in plundering and stealing from communities in the Papal States. He was a bona fide villain who had his enemies' throats cut in the presence of their mothers and wives while his followers, which numbered about 200 well-armed and well-trained men, well, while they danced and sang obscene songs. The Papal troops had refused to fight against the bandits, and foreigners had to be enlisted. Plus, Piccolomini had safe places of refuge in Gubbio and also Petiliano, from these strongholds, he made his raids into the Papal States, where he was joined by some of the malcontent nobles of the time. In fact, Piccolomini became so dangerous that in the end, June of 1582, Pope Gregory XIII had to come to an arrangement with him in which he would be pardoned with the proviso that he withdraw to the city of Florence. And there, the Medici positively honored him. And they extended their hospitality even in Rome, where Piccolomini, the bandit chief, resided with Cardinal Ferdinando de' Medici at the Villa Medici on the Pincio. But brigandage continued, threatening even the safety of Rome. Many of the nobles, who seemed to think themselves above the law, were in secret agreement with the bandits, and they gave them shelter. And the Orsini, I will say, were especially culpable in this. And in general, some nobles conducted themselves just as they pleased. For instance, in April of 1581, Paolo Giordano Orsini, the Duke of Bracciano, had the nephew of Cardinal Montalto, the future Sixtus V, murdered, and then absconded with his wife, whom he later married. And in Rome, in September 1583, Paolo Giordano and Lodovico Orsini sparked a riot that a contemporary compared to the sack of 1527, and Giacomo Boncompagni's representative, Vincenzo Vitelli, was murdered in the melee. On a happier note, Giacomo was fortunate in his marriage match, Costanza Sforza. She was the direct granddaughter of Costanza Farnese, who in turn was daughter of Alessandro Farnese, later Pope Paul III. 
and Giacomo's new wife was the daughter of Sforza Sforza, the Count of Santa Fiora and a famed condottiero, and she brought a dowry of 50,000 crowns. The two married in Rome at the Vatican on the 5th of February, 1576. Giacomo was age 27 and Costanza a bit younger, probably not quite age 16. The entire College of Cardinals attended the ceremony, and festivities were held also in Bologna. And Pope Gregory XIII even drafted a new identity document for the occasion. This was obviously a major, major public affair. Still, not all were pleased. We have a document by one Hans Jakob Schwartz, and he was a servant in the Swiss Guard at Bologna. And he opines, a pope ought not to have sons, and this man is therefore a bastard. Well, together, the couple would have 14 children with Ugo as the oldest son, but he died at age 15, the year 1602, and Gregorio Boncompagni as the oldest male child to survive into full adulthood and thus able to continue the line. Gregorio also inherited his father's many titles, served in the Senate of Bologna, and was nominated Captain General of the Army in the state of Milan in the year 1622. The important thing is that future members of the Boncompagni family were descended from this Gregorio. Well, the same year as his marriage, that is the year 1576, Giacomo was made a patrician of Venice, registered with his descendants. Oddly, the decree granting nobility calls Giacomo, despite the fact that his father made no secret of the relationship, as, quote, a close relative of the Pope, unquote. Despite all this, the ambassador of Venice in 1578 expressed wonder that Giacomo Boncompagni should receive so little in comparison with the relatives of other popes. He gives as the reason that Gregory XIII wished at all costs to avoid giving the impression that he thought more of his own family than that of the splendor of the church. In fact, contemporaries, other contemporaries, wondered how Giacomo was going to maintain himself upon the death of the pope. In 1578, he had a revenue which was considered small. Uh, by the standards of papal relatives, 7,000 scudi in um, 1578, and uh, which was bumped up uh, a few years later to 9,000 scudi. Still, there's numerous documents from the family that show Giacomo, especially in his early years in Rome, actively looking after the buying and selling of offices of the papal curia, also the trade of land outside Rome, and investment in banking and what I'd call proto-industrial enterprises, like a paper mill and a, a wool factory. For what had an enormous material impact on Giacomo's fortunes was his acquisition, with his father's help, of a series of fiefdoms, both north and south of Rome, in areas outside the papal states. Gregory XIII seems to have wanted both to benefit his son with his own personal estates, but also to extend his own influence. There was an unsuccessful attempt in February 1577 to buy him uh, the position of Marquis of Saluzzo. This Saluzzo is a wealthy Piedmont town right on the border of France, and the price was 600,000 crowns, and despite being offered healthy incentives by the Pope, the French king, Henry III, refused. Gregory XIII then turned to his plan B. He bought for his son the title of Marchese of Vignola in 1577. This is in today's province of Modena in Emilia-Romagna, lay outside the papal states. The Pope purchased Vignola for 70,000 gold scudi from Alfonso d'Esta, the Duke of Ferrara. He was the grandson of Lucrezia Borgia. Vignola brought with it possession of the imposing medieval castle known as La Roca, the Rock, that is just now exciting much interest for its surprising examples of rediscovered 15th century Italian mural painting. Well, we soon, I mean already in 1579, find Giacomo at Vignola granting important privileges, for instance to some Jewish bankers because it would open a bank in the town. Then came a particularly consequential investment and investiture in the south, Giacomo's creation as Duke of Sora and Arce in late 1579. Giacomo had it purchased for him from Francesco Maria della Rovere, the Duke of Urbino, for 100,000 gold scudi. The Duchy of Sora came with a spectacular castle at a site named Isola Liri on the Liri River. The town of Sora was an important one because it was situated in the Kingdom of Naples near its border with the Papal States and the Spanish king, Philip II, saw to Giacomo's investiture at Sora 
on the 23rd of December, 1579. And as might be imagined, there were important later honors, such as citizen and senator status at Ravenna in 1581, and feudal acquisitions, such as at Arpino, which is the birthplace of the Roman commander and seven-time consul Gaius Marius, and also the orator Marcus Tullius Cicero, and this came in 1583. As a result of all this, Giacomo became one of the richest and most prestigious members of the Roman aristocracy, even though, or perhaps because, none of his estates was located in the papal territory. 